This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. We all be so I didn't have on the one only Mr. Brother Stephen Simmons. He got something he need to say about his mistreatment over the years as it relates to the city of Memphis government. How you doing today, sir? All right. And so tell us, like, why are we here today? Like, what, what are we talking about here? You had an incident that happened to you? Well, I was a mechanic for the city of Memphis. I got run over by a truck at work in the shop, which was no fault whatsoever of mine. I got pinned between a garbage truck, a steel table, a half moon hand while staying in a concrete wall. Mm. I spent two and a half months in the hospital. It crushed my pelvis and severed the main artery running through the pelvis. So I was literally bleeding to death. And the city gave me the type of treatment that I wouldn't give to my dog mm. if he got hit by a car. But I was forced retired and stuff like that, but what happened was this, you know, after when the truck hit me, there was another mechanic standing right next to me. He told me I pushed him out the way. And I was asked by a free service administrator, Eric Hollow, Eric Hunter, why would you try to save somebody else instead of say yourself? And I felt like that was really a, a really awful question to ask somebody because this was a split second decision you had to make to make them to, to do something because both our lives were in serious danger. We we were in jeopardy of losing our lives right there. So I was um, I spent two and a half months in the hospital. I wind up losing five toes off my right foot because I wind up getting a staph infection while in the hospital called Mercy, which is a flush eating staph infection. And I lost other body parts, which is private, but I lost other body parts. I have nerve damage and muscle damage in my right leg and foot that prevents me from, from it, it makes my right leg and foot stay tight all the time which the city even sent me to a physical therapist for that. Mm -hmm. And the physical therapist was sitting there twisting and yanking and pulling on that ankle. And I had to ask the lady, what did they tell you happened to my ankle reading they sent me here? They said, well, your ankle got hurt when you got ran over at work in the shop. I'm like, no, my ankle didn't get hurt. So there was a nerve running through my pelvis that got pinched when they pulled my pelvis back in place that causes that right leg and foot to stay tight. It tells them, I guess tell the muscle to stay tight all the time. So I went through the physical therapy thing, even though like I told her, I wasn't gonna do no good because if you don't fix the nerve, you, you ain't doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Which I told the city, I told the hospital that something had happened when I first got hurt. When, the, when I got hurt and the animals came in they put a belt around my waist to pull my pelvis back in place. My right leg and foot went numb. Mm -hmm. That was the first time it happened. So I told them about it. But then when they rushed me to the hospital, they did have to do an emergency artery graft to repair that artery that was severed. Mm -hmm. um, then 18 days later, they went in, well, first they had to cure up the staph infection that I had in my pelvis. Um, before they could seal me up or before they could repair the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And when they repaired the pelvis and put the pins and plates in there, this right leg and foot went numb again. And I told them that was the second time it happened. So I believe there was a nerve or something being pinched in my pelvis. Nobody paid no attention. Nobody was listening. Mm -hmm. So a year later, they sent me to a neurologist. The neurologist said that in order for him to try to figure out what's causing this problem, 
he had to go in there. He said it's a cluster of artery, veins, and nerves that you had to go in there and separate. Mm -hmm. And he said because of how long it's been, if he went in there to do that, he felt it would do more damage than it would good. So he wasn't willing to do it. And this was a neurologist, a professional. But, you know, every time I tell somebody about something, it don't mean nothing because it's not affecting them. Mm -hmm. With them as the city. But as it went on, um, after I got out of the hospital, the city gave me a promotion while I was off sick. Hmm. From a mechanic helper to a master mechanic. Then came back and told me, well, we can't actually put you in a position until you actually release to go back to work. But when the doctor released me to go back to work, they turned and told me, no, we pay you to stay at home. They did this for six months until they forced retired me. And get, put me on in line of duty pension, cut my salary down less than 60% and tell me they gave me something. I'm like, how did you give me something? All I did was lost in this thing. I've lost my health and strength. I lost my livelihood. I lost my ability to run. If somebody tried to rob me or got at me, I couldn't run from you. Mm -hmm. If somebody was harming my family, I couldn't chase you. I couldn't, I couldn't do nothing. If I turned around too fast, I'd fall down. But, you know, none of this is nothing to the city. Then the city only covered you on OGI for three years. After them three years, they write you off. No medical, no medication. You can't go to the doctors, nothing. So this was a work-related accident, though. This is a work, yes. No, a work he didn't work his company. Anything like any. The city opted out on workman's comp. Mm -hmm. This is what I ran into. The city opted out on workman's comp. Mm -hmm. So they got a third-party company that handled the OGI program. And what the city do, they set aside $150,000 for only job injury medical expenses. Mm -hmm. Then if they decide to settle out with you and not let you come back, the max they require to give you by law is $300,000. It's called government tort liability. That's so the max they require to give you. But then they got another clause now that says that if your medical expenses exceed that $150,000, the city has the right to recoup some of their losses. And I'm standing trying to think of what that means. But they, they, they brought it to me real quick. Mm -hmm. What that means is that it starts eating away at that $300,000 and basically you can wind up with nothing. But they're blaming you for something you had no control over. Right. So they blame you for the accident. Basically, yeah, because I found out later on that they falsified my accident report. They put in the accident report, they said that a truck that I was working on, the parking brake wasn't set properly. Like it's something I did wrong. Mm -hmm. But I never seen a touch this truck until it hit me in my back. You actually moved him out the way. I actually pushed another mechanic out the way. Wow. And because it wasn't but one way out in front of that truck. Mm -hmm. And he was in it. Imagine, did he testify for Did he help you? Like, say, hey, you know, this guy, did he speak up for you at all? The well, you say? when we did, when we were doing deposition, they mm -hmm. actually threatened him. Told okay. him if he said anything about it, I pushed him or anything, or touch them anything, that they were gonna find. Now, who was the day? Like, who are these people that you referred the to? The city of Memphis. The okay. supervisors, probably Eric Hunter, which, okay. which, like, I found out when we were doing depositions. Gene Mays, who was the supervisor over the sanitation department at the time when I got hurt, mm -hmm. he spoke me coming in doing deposition. We were doing depositions. So, we were there doing depositions. They turned around and told me, my attorney, and everybody else that was there, the course of knocked me back, that Gene Mays was not gonna be able to be there. Mm -hmm. Because Gene Mays had just had a massive heart attack and was in the hospital. So when we, when we finished doing everybody else's deposition, we wrapping up everything, the court was knocked, putting up her machine and everything, the attorneys every, getting ready to go. I'm standing in the door with my attorneys off, and who come pulling up other than Gene Mays? Mm -hmm. With his grandbaby in the car with him. But this man spoke in the hospital just had a massive heart attack. I'm like, you know, how can he be in the hospital and he had a massive heart attack and this man driving around with his grandbaby? So that's another part of the fraud, another part of the perjury that the city's committing. 
because just like they said that I was working on that truck, mm -hmm. I had nothing whatsoever to do with that truck. And who told them that I was working on the truck, I have no idea because my supervisor told them I wasn't working on the truck. The guy in the shop told them I wasn't working on the truck because I had no dealing with this truck that ran over me. So you just saw the truck was... No, moved. I heard the brake release. You heard the brake release, but nobody was in the truck though, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the mechanic that was actually working on the truck. What happened was, which was a violation of company policy anyway, a driver pulled the truck in the shop, mm -hmm. left it running, in gear, with the fast idle on, and put the work brake on instead of the park brake. Okay. So when the mechanic that was actually checking the truck out, got up in the truck and started checking it out, and mess around and touch that service brake, that released the work brake. So that meant you got a truck running full force to a shop, not two or three feet behind, not one mechanic, but two. But nobody was in the actual truck when they- No, it was a mechanic in the truck. Ah, uh, he couldn't even stop it. Well, if, if you tap that service brake and mm -hmm. take your foot off for it, and you don't realize that the truck is in gear and it's finna take off, mm -hmm. So like you, 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 you actually like a hero. You save a co-worker's life at your own expense and they punishing you for it. That's what you tell they, Well, they told they talked to me like they told me I was told this exactly. Okay. Why would you try to save somebody else instead of save yourself? Wow. And I'm like, well, really didn't have a whole lot of time to give it no thought, to mm -hmm. stand there and discuss with him what we need to do or whatever like that. This was, I mean, you got a truck running full force to a shop, not rolling, not just inching, but you got a truck running full force to a shop under full power. You are the exception. I don't think a lot of people would have get in front of, so you just came out to you trying to put it. No, what it was, myself and the other mechanic, mm -hmm. we were putting a water pump gasket on a water pump in a, on a, in a vice on the table. Okay. When they pulled the truck in behind us, to check this truck out. Which is what we, it, it happens all the time. We do it all the time. So you hear somebody pull the truck in behind, you really don't pay the whole lot of attention. You keep on doing what you're doing. Cause you really don't think at the time that your life is in danger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you keep on doing what you're doing. And next thing you know, like I said, I heard the brake release and I knew we were in trouble then. Mm. And it, like I said, wasn't no time to think about it, debate on it or discuss nothing. It was time to make a move. When I heard that brake release, I knew it was time to make a move. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't one way to make a move, and that was the way he was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm like, I've been explaining this for the past going on seven years now, mm -hmm. that I had nothing whatsoever to do with that truck. Mm -hmm. Councilman Boyd was the one brought it to me last year, well, earlier part of this year, that he went and pulled the accident report and said, well, the accident report said that a truck that you were working on the parking brake wasn't set properly. But then when I told him what actually happened, I said, well, no, that ain't what happened. I said, let me tell you what really happened. What happened was the driver pulled the truck in the shop, left it running in gear with the fast side on, and put the work brake on instead of the park brake. Then when the mechanic that was working on the truck got up in and started checking the truck out and messed around and touched that service brake, that released the work brake. So you got a truck running full force through a shop. I was told by Councilman Boyd, this conversation should never been held out online like this because you know the city council meeting recorded and mm -hmm. put online. Say this conversation should never be held online like this. This conversation should be held behind closed doors. I'm like, well, it's okay for you to say it was my fault out online like this, but it ain't okay for the truth to be said online like this. That's crazy. And so, did, it, did you file your own incident report? Did anybody interview you for that incident report or talk to you directly? Well, I know you was in they, pain at the they, time. They, they, they came out to the hospital. Eventually, I think they did a, did a, um, both they did a, they said they did an interview with me, a statement, or did a, some kind of report with me. I don't recall it because, like I said, the first thing I remember after, after coming out of surgery was having tubes stuck down my throat and couldn't could and couldn't hardly breathe and trying to pull them out. That's interesting. So, so exactly, why would they talk exactly to you when they, exactly they when they did an interview with me, I have no idea. That would have been the best but time. But my wife was there with me the whole time, so I don't know exactly when the interview was done. Did she but verify they did she it? She don't remember it. But, but she was there the whole but time. The thing is, okay. Yeah, but the thing is, when they asked my supervisor about it, they even had nerd asked my supervisor, did they take him for a drug test? 
and asked me several times. He finally turned around to the lady and said, ma'am, I don't mean no harm, I don't mean no disrespect, but I don't think the animal stopped at the drug test and stayed on the way to the hospital. This man just got crushed by a truck. But now, the guy that pulled the truck in the shop, they gave him promotion. Really? So man, and I ain't heard nobody saying nothing about sending him for a drug test. Let me ask you this then, like, what was your relationship before this incident? What, what date was this, did this happen? April the 7th, 2013. So we're now December 22nd, 2019, having this conversation. Yeah. So you've been doing several years trying to get your story out there. Uh, did you have, were you known, did you have a certain reputation at your workplace before this incident, like being a rebel rouser or being outspoken? I was wanna... a union steward. Okay, you, okay. I was a union steward that represented the members. Mm-hmm. I worked with the members, I worked with the people, I worked, I was a, a rec operator. Okay. When I first started to work with the city, mm -hmm. when the city came up with this roadmap to discovery thing in 2010, 2011, and started outsourcing a bunch of different divisions, the record serves one division that was outsourced. Mm -hmm. And they sent my whole unit home. Hmm. Now, the memorandum of understanding state that all displaced full-time permanent employees are supposed to be placed in permanent comparable positions comparable to the salary that they were making. Mm -hmm. This didn't happen. We were all sent home. Some of us were sent out to the police and pound lot part-time temporary. They talked to one guy about working sanitation part-time temporary. But that wasn't what the contract stated. The contract stated we all supposed to be placed in full-time permanent position comparable to the salary that we were making, but didn't happen. So I got sent over to the police and pound lot. Now I'm thinking I'm still gonna be making my same salary. Next thing I know, I get cut down to 30 hours. Mm -hmm. My salary get cut down to $12. I lose my benefits, everything. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why are you union not... except Do you union try to get your benefit? What's the purpose of having a union to protect your benefits? The union even stopped talking to me. And I was a union steward. Wow. They stopped talking to me. Only way I could talk to somebody and ask me, who was the union that I was on at the time, I had to pop up at the union hall just to talk to somebody. And you was an officer, and you know, so you had and I was, right, I was yeah. the chief steward. Right, right. At the record service. So you been basically what they call blackball. Yeah. And it wasn't even, they're trying, everybody's blaming you for this incident that cost you your health and your wage. Yeah. So you had fought for this. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? I mean, this is like happening back in 2013, say April 2nd, 2013. Yeah. This is December 22nd, 2019. So how, how has life been for you since that time? Well, since that time, I've been harassed by the city. I've been threatened by the city. I've been discriminated against by the city. I've been retaliated by the city. I've had police department, city code enforcement, county code enforcement, health department, channel 13 news. All these people have been sent here to my house for the past seven years. Mm -hmm. I pulled up one day and had eight police cars in my yard. Wow. And I'm like, I come around and ask them, uh, what's going on? Police all tell me, why you didn't come to the door when we knocked on the door? I said, man, I just pulled up and saw all y'all in my yard. What's going on? Man said, well, we got a report of somebody stealing cars in the neighborhood. I stopped him right there. I said, let me stop you right there. You mean to tell me I'm gonna steal somebody's car in this neighborhood and park it in my front yard? I said, man, they shooting up houses and burning them down right here on this street, mm -hmm. on the next block. My house be the next house on the chopping block. I said, that's the best you can come up with? I said, I work for the same criminals you work for. I work for the city of Memphis. Since then, I've had code enforcement at my house. I've been in court so much for code enforcement, I should have had a job with them. Wow. Code enforcement come here, every time they tell me to do something, I did what they tell me to do, then they come back and change it. Okay, city code enforcement side, they were gonna drop their case against me back here about a year or so ago. All right, they dropped their case, but they put county code enforcement on me. Mm -hmm. When the county code enforcement first came out here, the man said he really, didn't, he really didn't see no purpose of it because he said, well, the city already got you in court. So the only thing we could do is give you a citation to take you to court also. And he said, that's overkill, it don't make sense. Mm -hmm. When they already got you in court. 
So he said, after I told him what was going on, he said, well, the complaints you get is not coming from no neighbors. It's not about your yard. It's not about the cars. So these complaints are coming from either the mayor's office or the city council. And I've been dealing with this. Matter of fact, I'm still going to court right now with county code enforcement. Do you have any proper legal representation? Do you have any lawyers that's helping you with this case? No, I can't get anybody to take the case. Really? I can't, no, I, no fact, lawyer in I can't County. actually get nobody to really talk to me. No lawyer in Shelby County, no lawyer no. in Tennessee. Once I tell them who I'm, who I'm up against, they do talking to me. They don't handle this type of case, or it's a conflict of interest, or they, you know. Not even the ACLU, nobody, no organization. Nobody. I've called, I've called agencies after agencies after agencies try to get some help with this situation. I've posted face, posted videos on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I, matter of fact, my son just set up a, a GoFundMe page. Okay. But even when I go to court now, I got a court case. I filed a lawsuit July the 1st of this year. And the city did respond back to the court. Mm -hmm. So the clerk told me that I need to file default judgment. Say they don't automatically give you default judgment. You have to file for it yourself. So I filed for the default judgment. The, the courts give you 30 days to respond back after everybody been served. And the service has been shown to the court clerks. You take the service card and show that everybody been served. Mm -hmm. You have 30 days from that date to respond back to the court. Mm -hmm. The city chose not. They spoke to respond back by August the 19th. Okay. They did. The first time the city responded was August the 30th, which I had already filed the default judgment. But the judge turned around and ignored my default judgment. Judge Robert Wise, okay. Division 8 Circuit Court, Shelby County Circuit Court. He just ignored my motion for default, for default judgment and turned around and told me I need to respond to the city's answer. I'm like, why am I responding to the city's answer when the city answer came in after the, the deadline? So he told me that didn't matter. I still had to respond to the city's answer. So I responded to the city's answer. They said I didn't send out any summonses. So I went back and I filed summonses for everybody that I was suing. The summonses all went out. The city had 30 days to respond back to the court again. They still didn't respond back. I filed default judgment again. Mm -hmm. A few days later, after I filed for default judgment, the city sent in another response. The judge turned around, ignored my default judgment again. Turned around, and told me I need to respond to the city's answer, telling me that I didn't respond to their first answer. I'm like, well, yes, I did. Even the city attorney turned, turned around, and told me well, he did respond and gave me the date and everything, but still didn't make no difference. So the judge got to telling me that what you need to do is say there's thousands of attorneys in the city's own business. You need to go talk to one and find out about the rules and guidelines procedure of court proceeding. I told the judge, I said, well, I got a professional attorney standing here right next to me. And he's not following the rules and guidelines of court proceeding. And I told him, no, are you? Mm. So the judge turned around and told him, well, you just need to answer, the, you just need to resp respond back to the court to the, to the city's answer. I'm like, okay, so in other words, you're telling me is that the rules and guidelines set forth this 30-day response deadline that the court set forth don't count. No, that ain't really what I'm saying. I'm like, yes, it is. Because you have told me I had to answer to the city's response that come after that deadline twice. Mm -hmm. Then the city also, the city sent a pack of papers to my house, hand delivered by a Memphis police officer. This was on August the 30th. Of this year? Of this year. Of this year. Okay. Hand delivered by a Memphis police officer with my name and address on the envelope. And in the packet, it clearly stated that the reason why the city did not respond back to me and did not respond back to the court is because they had no contact information for me. <laughs> but... The envelope had my contact information on it. So that's perjury, right? It's something. That, so I'm yeah. like, I turn around and I filed a complaint with the Judicial Board 
I mean, with the Board of Professional Responsibilities for perjury that the city attorney was committing. They sent me a letter back, said they didn't see anything wrong with what the city attorney was doing. So I asked the lady, I said, now, if I have a pack of paper sent to my house, hand delivered by a Memphis police officer, mm -hmm. with my name and envelope, name and address on the envelope, isn't that contact information? She said, not really. I'm like, okay, well, let me rephrase that. I said, if I send a pack of papers to your house, mm -hmm. With your name and address on the envelope, isn't that contact information? Well, yeah, you right, but okay, but the, then I found the lady that I was talking to, she wasn't the one that was handling my case. So she said she hadn't read it. I said, you didn't read that on, on the documents that I sent you? She said, no. I was like, well, can I talk to the lady that was handling my case, who was Sandra, Sandy Gar Gardner, Gar Garnett? They would not let me talk to her. So I hung up and called back and asked for her directly. She answered the phone, I spoke with her, and she said, well, she didn't receive all the documentation that I sent. So I sent it to her again. She said she was gonna look it over again, go back over it again. Now, they won't even let me talk to this lady. Hmm. I've called there roughly about 10 times since then. I leave a message, they have someone else to call me back. They would not let me speak to Ms. Garnett. So the last time I talked to somebody, the lady said she, they were gonna look into it again. And I think that was after I filed, started posting things on Facebook, videos on Facebook. The lady told me they're gonna look into it again. And she was, I guess she was sitting there looking at the file mm -hmm. and said that she didn't really see what I was talking about until I explained what I was talking about. Then she said she saw it, so they supposed to be re-looking into it. But I also filed a complaint with the Board of Professional I mean the Board of Judicial Conduct. And I sent them the same documentation showing where the judge is going along with the perjury and fraud that the city is committing. The last thing they told me that, well, maybe they didn't have your contact information when they sent this packet out. I'm like, but you had my name and address on the envelope. You sent it by hand delivered by a member police officer. You had to tell this man where I live in order for him to bring it. Mm -hmm. That's contact information. Also, I've been affiliated with the city for 12 years. You send me an inline due to pension check on the 15th and 30th of each month. You send my insurance papers here to this house for my insurance that I purchased through the city, which I've heard several people tell me I shouldn't have to they, they should have gave me my insurance because of what happened, but I'm not the right flavor. But, I mean, I've had things said to me like, um, the city council told me, said, you could have refused medical treatment in order to get your settlement. If I had refused medical treatment, I'd have died. Let me ask you this, because you brought up the fact that you had some type of issue with your, your pelvic situation, right? Yeah. You told them right, they had something ain't right, and they delayed it, and then a year later you found out there was some type of damage that needed to be... Nerve damage. Nerve damage, but yeah. is that like malpractice, or is it like a form of... They, they... Well, I've talked to people about that there, and I guess because this is sort of like dealing with, also dealing with the part with the city, mm -hmm. nobody really want to talk about that either. All the way up to the time when I lost my toes, and I mean, I got a staph infection that I've never had when I'm in the hospital, and I've been told that a lot of people get staph infection when they're in the hospital. Yeah. But now, I get a flush eating staph infection in the hospital, and people act like it ain't about nothing. I mean, my body deteriorating, and people act like it ain't about nothing. Do you have a health care plan now? Do you have any health insurance now? Well, I wind up having to file, well, I still have my policy through the city, mm -hmm. which is, which changes look like every year or whatever. But, I mean, I pay $500 a month for it, over $500 a month for insurance. Mm -hmm. And like I said, they cut my salary down less than 60%. So, by the time I pay my insurance, I wind up with less than $1,400 a month. And you have a family to support. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then 
I wound up having to file for, I went to file for my social, social security. Social security office turned me down twice. They said I wasn't blind, I wasn't disabled. I said, well, the city members say I'm disabled. You missing body parts, ain't it? I mean... Well, they, they, I guess them body parts didn't count, but they said I yeah. wasn't blind, I wasn't disabled. So they turned me down twice. So I wound up having to go hire an attorney anyway just to get my disability started, get my social security started. But now the same attorney that took my case for my social security mm -hmm. was the one that asked took my case when I first got hurt, which was Morgan and Morgan. They took my case when I first got hurt. The first week I was in the hospital, Morgan and Morgan came out there. They took my case. A week later, they pulled out. Basically, I said, well, no money in them because even my attorney said, well, since the city only set aside $150,000 for only job in the medical expenses, and they have a right to recoup some of their losses, my medical expenses went over half a million dollars my first month in the hospital. And like I said, I was in the hospital for two and a half months. You had so, some losses. So that, you had some real losses. You yeah. had some body parts. Yeah. Maybe mental anguish, all types of stuff going on. Yeah, to depression, everything depression, going right. on. And I'm like, everybody act like there's nothing wrong with it. Folk tell me, you need to drop all this stuff and get on with your life. <laughs> yeah, this is my life. Right. Which part of I mean, I have muscle spasm so bad. Till I literally hit a muscle spasm and accident, make my own body throw me across the room. Wow. I, mean, I, wind, I wind up getting pimped in my bedroom, between my bed and my door from a muscle spasm. My wife couldn't get out the room to get help for me, to get my son or anybody to come and help so me your because body, like, I'm possessed. pinned between the bed and the door. So your body, you lost control of your body like it was possessed by another entity, right? Mus when muscle spasm hits you, uh -huh. it's like your body just, it just, I mean, you ain't, you, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't in control of nothing no more. Right. Cause when the muscle spasm hits you, you there until they decide to turn you loose. Do they happen often, the muscle spasm? They, I had a muscle spasm down to the council meeting one day. Wow. When they were doing the interview for the, when they were doing the uh, negotiation for the fire department, mm -hmm. I had a muscle spasm right down in, 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 to, in, 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 in the city council meeting. They had the fire chief to come check on me. One fire chief came over and he put his hand on my back. He said, man, you hot. He said, you just come in from outside. I said, no, I've been sitting with it for the past three hours. Mm -hmm. I said, but when the muscle spasm hits you, that pain runs your body temperature up. You have sweat dropping off you like you running down the street or something. Mm -hmm. In the sun. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when them, when them muscle spasm start hitting it, it locks you up. You so, ain't going nowhere, you ain't doing nothing. You can't really drive really, right? You aren't supposed to drive or? You gotta do what you gotta do, or what? Well, I do what I gotta do, but is that scary though to know that you can lose control like that at any moment? I've had to pull over and get out the car, mm -hmm. and wait till must have to turn me loose. But they say you have when a they disability. First, when they first start happening, I've even had this thing where I had to pull over and call my wife to come get me. Wow. But now I, I, I get, I, I can pull over, and I, I might stand there about. Five, 10, 15 minutes for it to find the side to turn me loose. So you basically you're a prisoner of your body, are you telling me? You're a yeah, prisoner basically, of your body. yeah, because like I said, when he muscles bad hits you, you, you dare to stay. You ain't going nowhere, you ain't doing nothing, you ain't holding no conversation. You, I mean, you stand there and your body just takes over and do what it won't do. So I'm gonna rewind it down. I mean, this is crazy. But you tell me this actually happened, it has happened to you. Uh, I know we met at the Bloomberg Healthcare Unveil earlier this past week on Thursday. And they didn't give us a chance to ask any questions of the, the presidential candidate who's a multi-billionaire, he's worth $8 billion. But what would you want to ask him? Uh, in particular, anything in particular you want to ask him? Or? Well, actually, I wanted to ask him about what was his view on government corruption, mm -hmm. local government corruption. I mean, they got Donald Trump impeached, but I'm like, what about local government, the city of Memphis government, that people get hurt on this job mm -hmm. and they just toss you to the trash. Just toss you to the side like it ain't about nothing. Mm -hmm. After three years, you you wrote off. You, you don't, nothing count for nothing. I mean, I got medication. The day that they dropped me from the OGI program, the first phone call I got, mm -hmm was from 
Walgreens. They said, we got a prescription here. The copay on this prescription was $700. I'm like, ooh. $700 dollars like, copay. $700 copay. <laughs> right. I'm like, man, I ain't got the nerd to ask what the original price is, right. but it was $700 copay. Mm -hmm. I'm like, shoot, that's it. I get $1,400 money. Mm -hmm. like, and I got a $700 copay on this one prescription. The next day, I got another phone call. The copay on this prescription was $400. So that's 11. And that's just two prescriptions out of 10. Mm -hmm. So, what, what am I supposed to live off of if I buy all this medication that the city is no longer paying for? Mm -hmm. Then every doctor that I see is a specialist. My primary care doctor has nothing whatsoever to do with these injuries that I have because the city had their own specialist doctors that you had to go to. And my co primary care doctor wasn't covered under the city's plan, so when they dropped me, when they dropped me, I wound up getting that staph infection came back. Right. I had a little hole in my leg. I went to the wound care clinic where I've been going for the past few years. They said they couldn't see me unless I get a referral. So I'm calling around, who do I get a referral from? Since the city didn't drop me from the OGI program. I called Cedric. Cedric said, well, you had to get a referral from your primary care doctor. I called my primary care doctor. They don't know what to do about this because they've had no dealing whatsoever with this situation, period. This was handled by the city doctors, by the specialists, and whatnot, and like I said, once they drop you from the OJI program, you have no longer had a coverage. And then you know specialists, co-pays on specialists, a whole lot more than going to a regular doctor. Okay, well, Mr. Sims, how long you worked with the city? I worked for the city five years. Five years, and like you was a city mechanic, I mean, you worked on all the city government cars, there's police cars, there's garbage trucks, dumpster trucks, everything, right? I worked on whatever buses, pulled up in that shop. Well, well oh matter, God, matter bus is a different. Okay, different, okay, different, different, but different police thing. cars, dumpster trucks, all, whatever the city yeah. used. So for five years, they give you all this hell for like the last what? Going on seven, seven years. Seven years. I've been going through the same nonsense. Matter of fact, the most recent incident I had. They sent a whole tax squad to my house mm -hmm. just to bring me a message. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they last out of my grandbaby, my three-year-old grandbaby. Who was a tax squad? What's that? That's the police, uh, like the SWAT team. They sent a SWAT team here? Yeah, a whole SWAT team. Jeez. I had four carloads of tax squad police officers to pull up here at my house just to bring me a message. Now, if that's not intimidation, I'll pay you. Okay, like, we're wrapping it up, but we are, I definitely want to get your contact and how people can connect with you. Yes. Why the media, I mean, why local media has not covered this in the last almost seven years? I mean, what's the only issue? I can assume is that they got a media blackout on it. Mm -hmm. Nobody will talk to me about this situation. I've given every news station in this city documents on the lawsuit, before the lawsuit, when I first got hurt, mm -hmm. documents were the city, the city constantly saying that they gave me a settlement. They gave my wife a settlement for lost consortium. When the check was first made, well, when the paperwork was first made out, it had Stephen and Vivian Simmons. They made the attorney go back and take my name off and just put Vivian Simmons and her attorney. You never got compensated. It said, right? but it also said mm -hmm. on that same paper, mm -hmm. no money shall be paid to Stephen Simmons. Wow. For getting hurt working with city equipment. You got it documented? You got that photo? Yeah, I got it documented. Oh, wow. They give me a letter on it. So but, they never compensate, I mean, they never but, compensate but, you directly uh, then. But they still saying that they gave me a settlement. Even the city council said, well, we gave you in line to do the pension. I'm like, how are they giving me something? When I was coming to work making a full paycheck. Then you gave me a promotion while I was out sick, which would have raised my salary $8 an hour. And then turn around and said, well, we can't act put you in position until you release to come back to work. Then when I release to come back to work, you tell me, well, no, nah, we pay you to stay at home. That was like a joke to me. That was like you slapped me in the face with a joke. You give me a promotion, 
I'm like, what was the purpose of giving me the promotion in the first place if you wasn't gonna let me do it? Okay, well, brothers, as soon as we're gonna wrap this up at this session, we probably have to do a follow-up. Okay, how can we? No problem. How can we help you out? Like, what did we need? You said you had a GoFundMe. I got a GoFundMe page. Mm-hmm. It's um, no justice for Stephen Simmons for Stephen in Memphis, and also uh, I got a. My Facebook page, I got all my documents and different things on my Facebook page that you can pull up. And also, you can contact me at Stephen Simmons at 901-949-4980 at 781 Leaf Street, Memphis, Tennessee. And like I said, I was a, I was a city employee. They got treated like nothing. I was a citizen, I'm still a citizen of Memphis. They still get treated like nothing. All because I got hurt on the job. I was also told that uh, in order for them to let me come back to work, they said first of all, they had to have two of me. One to do the work and one to drive a truck because I couldn't drive a truck at the time. And I found out I'm the only person that they ever actually sent for a driving assessment. Which I didn't have no problem with that because I was afraid of driving a truck with the problem that I had with my leg. Right. But I also I was also told that well then on the other hand if something else were to happen you wouldn't be able to get out the way. And I feel like that's discriminating against me because of my handicap that was caused by getting hurt working for the city of Memphis. Right. I'm like, what you mean? I mean, even the fleet service manager turned around and said that, um, well, he ain't got to drive a truck. We can put it. We can put him at one of the precinct. He can work on squad car. They said no. I said, well, we we can uh, make him a farmer. They said no. We can make him a lead man. They said no. Everything this man said, they said we can put him in parking. They said no. Everything he said, they said no to. Mm -hmm. All they wanted me was gone. Well, Brother Simmons, we want to make sure that this story get out there and go viral. And we appreciate you, man. Yes, I'm glad for you to hang in there. You are somebody. Don't let them ever take that away from you. You are a man. Cause yes, you are, sir. You know, yes, sir. You're standing on your on your feet. I never knew, but from looking at you, the way you get around so well, you had all that going on with you, man. But I, I bless. I thank God for keeping your mind safe, keeping your family safe, keeping you safe. Uh, wish you amplified blessings and gratefulness in the year 2020 and beyond, man. We're going to get this done. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Appreciate Love it. you, Mandy. Keep yes, on sir. producing and pushing. Appreciate This is Brother Ron. I am asking you all to do me a big favor. Think about supporting the We All Be movement. Your donation is tax deductible. The We All Be Group Incorporated is a recognized 501c3. And I'm just asking you all because I want to keep on bringing y'all quality work uh, through the way that I know how to do best. And uh, I'm going to sing my praises and toot my horn. A lot of y'all were not hip to Dick Gregory until Brother Ron brought him on the We All Be platform, until that Django review we did. Y'all seen another side of Judge Joe Brown, and Judge Joe Brown's message has been amplified. But it was We All Be that brought Judge Joe Brown to y'all back in 2014. And so many others, and we covered so many things. So help us out so we can help you all. Peace.